Good morning and welcome to a morning edition of Husky Planet. I am Erica Gulbaki, the Associate Director of Alumni Relations for the College of Agriculture, Health and Natural Resources. I'm so excited you're joining us this morning. Um, hopefully our spring weather starts to warm up soon, um, but we are excited to talk about plants and, and how to grow them. And I am pleased to introduce our workshop leader and host for today's events, Erica Baylor. Erica graduated from UConn with a Bachelor's of Science in Horticulture and a minor in Landscape Design in 2010. She then earned her Master's of Arts in Curriculum and Instruction, specialized, specializing in Science Education in 2012. Erica is currently a plant science teacher and the Agricultural Science and Technology Education Department Head at Rockville High School. She has been teaching there since 2012 when she graduated from UConn. She teaches primarily plant science courses, and each spring, her students plan, seed, and grow flowers, hanging baskets, and vegetables as a fundraiser for the program. Erica first got her start in horticulture when she was accepted as an agri-science student from her hometown of Ellington. I just to share a little bit more about the program that Erica teaches in. The Vernon Agricultural Science and Technology Center is one of 20 in the programs in the state. The program located at Rockville High School is a regional high school option for students living in 10 area towns. Students are able to take courses in plant science, animal science, natural resources, and aquaculture. Students must apply and be accepted into the program, but it is free for students and transportation is provided by the student's town of residence. And just a little housekeeping note for today's event, um, if you have any questions at all, please put it in the Q&A function and we will pause throughout the program to get those answered for you. And with that, I will turn it over to Erica to teach us how to grow some beautiful plants. That will help you um, be successful in whatever you decide to start and um, try to grow this year. So um, I did make a little outline for today and I have some notes here that I'll kind of refer to. So I try to stay on track with, with what we're doing today. Um, but really the first thing to do um, and figure out is what is it that you wanna grow? <clears throat> um, there's all different purposes for growing things. You might want to um, just grow some food, right? Try some vegetables um, for yourselves, for your family. You might want to start some flowers um, that you would put maybe a border around your house. Maybe every year you go and purchase a bunch of annuals. Um, and this year you're thinking, well, can I try growing them myself instead of going and spending that money? Um, I'm buying them every year and planting them out. So some kind of a um, border. Um, you might also want to grow a cutting garden so that you have flowers that you can go and harvest um, and cut every week and bring indoors, put on your table. Um, so that's really something that a lot of people really enjoy. Um, another idea might be just to help um, attract pollinators, right? Um, I think more and more we're hearing of the need for that um, with the difficulties with bees um, and pollination of crops right now. Um, so just encouraging um, pollination is really good um, and you know, providing habitat um, and food sources for wildlife. So those are all different purposes and each one, um, depending on what your goal is, has a little different um, different considerations, different needs, different things to take into account. So I'll kind of go through each of those um, depending on what it is you're, you're thinking about doing. So we'll start with cutting garden. Um, if, you're, if you're planning to do a cutting garden, you're thinking about growing plants that are gonna get at least say 18 inches or taller, okay? If you're planning to grow things that are shorter than that, they're really not gonna be good for cutting. So in general, you're referring to plant species that are going to just be taller um, growth ones. And there's two different options um, for cutting garden. You can do annuals or perennials. So both of those, um, you can get species that are great for cutting. Um, you're gonna approach them a little differently, right? So an annual refers to a plant that you start from seed and um, it grows, it flowers, but then it dies in the fall. Right? It doesn't survive the winter and doesn't come up again. A perennial is something that does the same thing, seeding. You can start it from seed if you want to. Um, it grows, it flowers, it looks like it dies, 
in the fall, but only the um, foliage above the soil line, right? Only the top stuff dies. And actually those roots stay growing. They're just dormant in the winter time and they'll come up again the following year. So perennials are awesome um, because you keep getting them coming back, right? So they're a really good investment. But with cutting gardens, you can choose either annual or perennial. So it's just something to pay attention to when you're choosing what to grow. Um, oftentimes your seed packets will tell you if they are annuals or um, perennials. This one, for instance, is a Cosmo, um, says on the top that it's an annual. Um, the problem with perennials, if you're thinking of starting perennials from seed for a cutting garden, is that perennials do not flower all summer long. Annuals typically do, right? So something like a Cosmo, once they start flowering, they continue to flower all summer. Perennials will only flower for maybe two to four weeks. Okay? You might get about a month from start to finish of that um, flowering. So if you're thinking about doing perennials, ones that will come up every year, you really want to think about um, choosing ones for each season. Okay, so that's something um, to think about a little bit. And we can talk some more about that um, down the road. But um, for a cutting garden, some plant species that you choose are what we call cut and come again. So um, like the cosmos that flower all the time, you cut some and they will continue to grow and flower. So you really only need to plant them once in the spring and then you'll be able to harvest them all summer. There are some um, flowers that are sort of what we call one and done. Once you harvest them, there's nothing left. They're not gonna grow and produce another flower. So a sunflower would be a typical, what we call one and done, right? Um, sunflowers can be either branching. So you can have like a single stem with multiple smaller ones coming off of it, or they can be one single stem sunflower. But either way, once you harvest those flowers, it's not going to grow and it's not gonna produce more flowers, okay? So um, ones that are really good to keep cutting are zinnias, cosmos, bachelor buttons. Those would be um, three that are easy to grow and they will continue all summer for you. So once they start flowering, every week you can go and pick some and they'll continue to flower for you. So those are really, really good ones, especially if you're just starting out. Snapdragons and marigolds, these are some marigolds here. Um, those ones tend to produce maybe two flushes of growth for you. So say uh, this one has a nice flower bud here, ready to start flowering. If this was a tall marigold, right, there's different varieties. So you have to pay attention to, um, again, pay attention to that when you purchase your seeds, it'll tell you how tall they get. There are some marigolds that are good for borders and there are some marigolds that are good for cutting. So you wanna get the taller marigolds if you want to um, do a cutting garden. But as they flower, um, you would then cut the stem, right, and harvest this, and then it might start growing again and give you one more flush of growth like a month later, okay? But it's not something that you can continuously go out and keep picking. So marigolds um, are one of those, and same with snapdragons. You can pick the snapdragon once, and as long as you leave a few leaves, it will grow and it will flower again, but you'll probably only get one more flower from that and then it will be done. So just kind of paying attention to the different types um, for a cutting garden. So it's nice to kind of do some of everything, um, but if you're looking for the easiest ones to grow, produce um, flowers for you all summer, stick with those that we consider that cut and come again, like zinnias, cosmos, and bachelor buttons. Those would be um, really good ones for that. If you want to do ones like snapdragons and sunflowers or marigolds, you might want to do something that's called succession planting. That just means that you plant them, you start some seeds, and then two weeks later, you start some more seeds. So that way, if you harvest those sunflowers, you still have some sunflowers two weeks from now that will be flowering also, okay? So that's called succession planting. Instead of planting all your seeds right away, you save some of them, only plant a few, and the next week or two weeks from there, plant a few more, a few more, and a few more, like that. That will give you that summer long harvest, just like a zinnia would, okay? But a zinnia is gonna do it all on its own. Something like a sunflower snapdragon, you would have to succession plant if you want it to continue 
um, giving you a whole summer of blooms. So that's a little bit about a cutting garden. Um, I talked a little bit about attracting pollinators. Um, perennials are really good for that. Um, if you're looking to plant a flower garden um, that's gonna attract pollinators, think about planting what's called native species, right? Native species are ones that um, originated here, right? They are ones that have evolved over time in conjunction with animals. So in conjunction with the pollinators, they have this inter interdependent relationship with the wildlife um, and insects that are in your ecosystem. So if you want to support those, it's really good to choose plants that are native um, in order to really support those relationships, okay? Doesn't mean you have to do that, but just something to consider if you're just trying to attract pollinators and support your ecosystem with sort of more a more natural or native um, garden. Okay, edibles. If you want to grow, if your purpose is growing vegetables um, for yourself, for your family, um, or herbs, right, things that you can eat instead of just look pretty, um, try some new things, right? Seeding, starting things from seed is a great opportunity to try something that you've never grown before. Um, maybe you've re never really gotten into eggplants, right? Well, buy a little package of seeds and try them. It's amazing how, if you grow it yourself, how um, exciting it is to be able to harvest it and um, cook with it, right? And produce something um, that's, that's edible. So, you know, I just encourage you to try some new things um, if you want to do edibles. Um, it's also a great opportunity just for healthier eating, right? You know where these vegetables are coming from. Um, your, you know, if you're not using any um, pesticides or anything in your garden and you know um, that it's healthy, you're growing it with organic methods maybe. Um, so it's just a really neat opportunity to sort of know exactly where your food comes from and really to connect with um, your food, right? Um, I feel like we're getting farther and farther from that, right? We used to all be, um, this whole area used to be farms, right? And people lived sustainably. They all had gardens, they all grew their own food. And we've just gotten so far from that that I think um, reconnecting with the land, right? That we depend on um, for life is, is just a really, really neat thing to do. Um, I already talked about it being therapeutic, right? Again, if you're successful, as long as you can harvest something, it can be really, really satisfying um, for you. So we'll talk some more about that, but um, if you're thinking about edibles, definitely explore some different um, uh, different vegetables, things that you maybe have never never done before. And then um, sort of my last one option that I kind of put on here was um, the plant border, right? So the difference of a plant border from a cutting garden is generally you want to plant things that are lower. You're not really looking for plants that are like 18, 24, 36 inches tall. Um, you can do a border, you can sort of stagger, so you can put lower plants in front, and then medium plants, and then taller plants. So you might choose some things that only get about six inches, then choose something that gets more like nine inches, and then something that gets more like 12, right? And then you could plant a nice border, either like along your sidewalk maybe, um, or even in a planter, right? In a, in a pot, it's nice to have a variety of things where you have something that's lower, something that's middle, and something that's taller. So if you're doing a plant border or a container, think about different heights um, when you're choosing what, what seeds you want to get. Something like lobelia is really low, um, sort of cascading. Actually, I put some lobelia in here. Um, it's the beautiful blue flowers here. It has this really nice low cascading um, habit to it. So that's a great um, one for like the front of a border. Same with the petunias that are in here too. Something that might be more like your six inch um, six to nine um, would be some of the marigold varieties, right? If it's not like a um, super tall marigold variety, um, more like a, a medium one, small one um, is really good for there. And then um, for your 12 inch, you could do like salvia. There's different blue salvia, red salvia, white salvias, um, or even some zinnias, right? That you could use for the back of your border as well. Um, Erica, do we have any questions at this point um, just about purpose, about what to grow? Or I just also wanted to check in and make sure everything was working good from your end. Uh, no questions yet. Um, 
someone said the mic was going in and out, but I, I think other than that, um, everyone is telling us what they're planting. So we have some okra, we have some basil. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to continue to add to the chat. Okay, great. All right, so um, after you kind of have an idea of what it is you're looking to grow, the next thing to do is really figure out your location, right? Um, do you have the space for what you want to grow? You can contain your plant. You can plant directly in the ground, of course. Um, but one of the main things to think about is how much sun do you have? So if you have a patio or a deck or a balcony um, or some yard, how much sun does it get? Plants obviously need sun, right, to grow. And the amount of sun um, is really important for certain plants. So another thing that you'll see on your seed packet is if they need sun or shade or part sun. By far, most things need full sun, right? Most things that you're going to grow um, require full sun. Well, full sun refers to six hours of sunlight or more, right? but a minimum of six hours. So take the time to observe um, your surroundings and see if you're really getting enough sun to support growth. Again, it's nothing worse than doing all this and then not having any success, right? So think about, just, just think one day, maybe set an alarm and check like at 8 a.m., where's the sun, right? It's gotta be a sunny day to, to get a good idea. Um, and then check again at noon, check again at two, check again at four, okay? and observe how many hours of sunlight the area that you want gets. Um, if it gets six hours, awesome. Um, if it gets four hours, most things will do okay. Um, that's considered part sun. If it's only getting two hours, that's considered shade, right? Two hours of sun is really not enough to support um, good growth on most plants, right? Um, so try to find another location if, if that's where you were thinking. Um, the other thing to think about is we don't have leaves on the tree here yet, and at least where I am. Um, everything's flowering right now, right? Just starting to bud out. But once all the leaves are out, you're going to have more shade. So think about if you see, if you have shadows from trees, you're going to have a bigger area there that's actually going to be full shade, right? So pay attention to your tree shadows too, um, this time of year. There's definitely more sun this time of year than there will be once we have everything leaked out. Okay, so sun is really important um, for your location. The next thing for location um, is going to be the amount of space that you have, right? Whether that's containers or in the ground. Um, if you're growing vegetables, uh, there are some things that are going to need a lot more space than other things. So any of your vining plants, right, like watermelons, um, pumpkins, winter squashes, they need like six feet square just for one plant, okay? So think about how much space you actually have to devote to what you're growing um, and think about that in relationship to what it is you're growing. So tomatoes, you can do one tomato in, say, a five-gallon bucket, right? And you can put that out on your patio, um, and that's sufficient for one tomato. You could maybe do two peppers in the same amount of space. Um, you could do two squash um, of like a yellow or zucchini squash, not like a, a vining squash, like your butternuts, your acorn squashes, um, things like that are, are vining, and they take up a lot more room. But like your yellow squash or zucchini squash, um, you could probably do two seeds in a five gallon pot, that would be good. Um, you could do two green bean um, bushes, right? Probably in a, in a five gallon pot. Um, but vining plants take up a lot more space. For a cutting garden, if you're thinking about growing um, species for cutting, you can plant um, anything for cutting about nine inches is about the um, correct distance. When you're planting for cutting, you'd like to plant things fairly close because you want them to grow upright. If you give them more room, if you plant them farther apart, they won't grow as tall. They'll tend to grow 
um, a little wider and stay a little shorter because they're getting all the sunlight they need. Um, but if you crowd them a little bit, if you plant them more like nine inches together next to each other, they'll tend to um, grow taller because they'll need to. They'll say, oh no, I have another plant right there. I need to stretch up to get more sunlight. Um, so if you give them a little competition for space, they'll actually tend to grow a little taller for you. So for cutting garden, about a nine inch is recommended for most things. Some things can be six, some things 12, um, but in general, if you choose like nine inch spacing, you're, you're at a good, um, good space for, for cutting plants. Um, for doing plant borders, there I would just pay attention to whatever it says again on your packet, right? Um, this one says four to six inches apart for lobelia, okay? So again, that's just gonna depend on what variety you're planting um, and what the purpose is for that. Okay, so spacing is important, right? Thinking about and out, going out and actually measuring. Um, I mean, you can plant tons of seed and give half of them away, that's great too. Um, but just think about, re, you know, realistically, do you have the space for um, what, you, what it is you wanna plant, what it is you wanna grow? Um, one thing as far as location um, that's really nice to do is raised garden beds. And they have become a lot more popular. They're, um, you can buy kits um, even on Amazon to make raised beds. Um, but there's really a lot of advantages to those. You don't need big equipment like um, rototillers or things, right? It's a, it's a smaller, more compact space. You can just easily use a shovel, use a trowel or something, right, to turn the soil over to remove any weeds or anything. Um, they're much more manageable when you have um, like a raised garden bed. So definitely, um, definitely look into that um, if you've been thinking about it. They're easier to take care of. Um, and you also don't have to worry about your soil because you're putting soil there. So maybe you have, maybe your lawn doesn't really grow that good. Um, maybe you have rocky soil, maybe you have a really heavy clay soil in your area. And if you just put a garden bed on top of your soil and put in nice topsoil or um, soil builder that has like compost in it, you can actually buy bags of, um, mix that's specifically called um, raised, raised bed mix that's already formulated exactly for raised beds. So it's a great way to know exactly what's in there, have some great soil, um, and, and just a really, really good way to go. So if you're considering that, I definitely recommend it. I love raised beds. Erica, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, so an audience member asked if you wanted to plant picking cucumbers, could you add a trellis to a five gallon bucket or is that not recommended? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Cucumbers in it in a um, five gallon bucket is great. Yep. You could even just do some steaks or some kind of a little trellis um, and you could do cucumbers in there. Yep. That'd be work, work very well. And I have one more question that was submitted. Any tips for keeping pests away? Bugs, rabbits, squirrels, deer. Oh uh, yeah, fun, fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you're doing um, if you're doing like raised beds, it's really easy to just tack some chicken wire around your raised beds, and you can easily easily step over it, but you won't get rabbits or anything in there. Um, so that's really a um, great way. But um, as far as other pests or pests in general, um, if you're really doing enough gardening to make it worth it, you can purchase um, film. It's like, um, it's sort of like a really light netting that will keep away all insects and critters. Um, and you can buy poops. I have some poops right here. Let me grab a poop. I did just get some for us at school here. So um, these are just um, wires, right? Little metal um, wires that you just put in the ground and makes a little hoop, super lightweight, super easy to use. You just bend them uh, down. And then you purchase like, this is um, Agribon, it's called, A-G-R-I-B-O-N. 
think is the, is the name of it. And it's like this really light mesh. Um, and you drape that over the plants. And now you don't have any insects that are able to get on there, right? The plant isn't damaged because it's super lightweight. Water can get through, sun can get through, um, but insects cannot go in there and lay their eggs. So um, definitely recommend um, just, you know, it's always a, a matter of weighing the costs um, versus um, the benefits of what you're doing. But um, you can reuse it, right? As long as you're careful and you're not, you know, putting holes in it, reuse it for years. Um, and yeah, so, so that's really good. That would be the best thing for pests. Um, some people um, also I've seen will cover things just at night. Um, you know, a lot of your um, pests will come out and feed, you know, later in the day. Um, and of course it doesn't hurt to cover your plants at night because they're not getting sunlight anyways. Um, you just have to remember to uncover them in the morning. But even like a, um, a milk jug that you like cut off the bottom of the milk jug and put it over your plant at night to keep um, rabbits away um, dusk or early morning, um, which is the you know, most common feeding time um, for a lot of those rodent pests. Um, another little tip there, but the Agrabon cloth is, is really, really awesome, that netting. And while you're on the subject of the raised beds, one just came in. Um, how deep should the soil be in the raised bed? Uh, hmm, good question. Um, you really probably only need a foot. Um, I mean, you can do taller so they don't even have to bend over, right, when you're planting or weeding. But if you have, if you have 12 inches um, of soil, that's probably plenty for, for pretty much everything you're growing. Um, yeah, I would say 12 inches is a good, a good depth. Okay, so we talked about figuring out what to plant and location being really important, right? So the next thing then um, is to figure out, okay, I know what I want to grow, I know where I want to grow it, now how do I know when to start it? And this is really important. Um, you shouldn't just sow seeds inside um, just any random time. Um, timing really matters. Okay, a couple of reasons that it really matters. First of all, you need to make sure that you can harvest your crop, right? The growing season here um, in Connecticut pretty much, right, is like mid-May through September, right? It's between when we, um, our last frost in the spring and our first frost in the fall, right? Most of the things that we grow don't tolerate frost very well at all. Um, so you need to make sure that whatever you're growing is going to produce your crop, whether that's a flower or a pepper, right? So you have to plant early enough to be able to give it enough time to produce your crop. Um, but you don't want to start seeds too early. If you start seeds too early, you're going to have to be transplanting them, right? They're going to have problems. Um, plants only thrive so long in a container. These guys were planted probably um, what I would consider too early. Okay? We started these, um, I don't know, quite a while ago. But you can see that they are very well developed. Their roots have filled up all of this soil and they just have nowhere else to grow. So if I don't take these out of here and transplant them into something bigger, right, into a bigger container, for their roots to grow, they become what's called root bound or pot bound. And that can really stunt the growth of your plants. Okay? They will not grow properly, they will not thrive. And of course, that's not what we want. So starting things too early is not good. Also, if you are starting them in your house, which tends to have lower light conditions, um, they just won't thrive as well either for a longer period of time. You really want to have that, the shortest amount of time growing indoors um, that you have to have, okay? Um, plants obviously will do much better outside in full natural light than they will inside. You can supplement lighting, right, with um, grow lights, supplemental lighting, but, um, you know, nothing compares to sunlight. So 
planting too early is not good either. Okay. Uh, the problem, yeah, the other problem with transplanting <clears throat> I had in my note here I wanted to mention is once you've started seeds, right, um, growing in something little, if you have to transplant them, now all of a sudden you're going to have pots that are taking over your house, right? Maybe have a table full of seeds that you're starting. And then if you get to the point where you have to transplant, it just takes up so much room. Okay, so just, just another reason to not start too early. So how do you figure out when to start up? So um, again, your seed packet, right, has lots and lots of information on it. Um, don't rip your seed packets open and get them, um, ruin them, right? They have lots of valuable information that you can use all the time um, on them. <clears throat> so one of the things that you'll find um, is your days to maturity or bloom time. Again, <clears throat> different, um, every species, right? Different types of plants, different species of plants are gonna require different timing. Uh, just trying to see where this one says on it. I don't see it on that one. This one says 75 to 80 days to bloom. So that's a birthy brand. Um, this one I don't see either. This one has when to sow outside and when to start inside, but it doesn't say a general um, emergence or general um, maturity. So again, every seed packet, every brand is different. You really have to take the time to read what it says. But most seed packets will give you a day's to maturity. So maturity is different for every seed, not only um, depending on the type of plant, but depending on what your crop is. So if you're planting lettuce, Days to maturity means when you have a full head of lettuce. If you're planting cosmos, days to maturity means when you have flowers. Now lettuce is going to flower, but days to maturity doesn't mean flowering because you don't want to wait until your lettuce flowers because that means it's not good any longer, right? Lettuce makes a head and that's when we harvest it. If you let that lettuce head sit there, it will do something called bolting where it will send up a stalk. And that's where the, the flowers are produced and then the seeds are produced on that. So days to maturity is some, means something different depending on your species and depending on the purpose of what you're growing, okay? If you're harvesting um, a vegetable or if you're harvesting um, flowers, right? It's going to be different. So the other information you'll find is your days to germination. That is not as important. Um, that's just so that you know, that you don't look at your soil and say, how come it hasn't come up yet, right? Um, how many days it takes to emerge from the seed? That's germination. So that's very different than how many days it takes to mature and produce, this is a tomato, for instance, right? An actual fruit for you to eat. So days to germination is not um, a big deal. Um, but it does help you know, okay, when should I expect this? Should I expect it in one week, two weeks? Some things take three weeks, four weeks before you're going to even see them emerge from the seed. Okay, so that, that timing is really just sort of an FYI, right? Information so that you're not like giving up on your seeds. Um, another thing when you're trying to figure out um, when to plant is if you're going to direct seed or transplant. So notice I said this one tells you when to sow outside and when to start inside, okay? If you're sowing outside, that's considered direct seeding. You're seeding it directly into its permanent container, whether that's a garden bed, um, outside in your um, garden or wherever it is, right? If you're starting it inside, you're going to be transplanting it into its permanent container later. So you're starting it in something small um, and then transplanting it into a larger container or out into your garden bed outside, okay? And depending on how you're, which one you're going to choose is gonna make a difference also on how you grow and when you start to plant. 
If you're starting your seeds indoors, you want to pay attention to what it says about that, right? Versus if you're going to wait and just sow your seeds directly outside. Um, there's a lot of things you can do that with, um, but mostly what I'm talking about today is starting seeds inside to sort of get a jump on the season, um, to start growing some things when it's so exciting this time of year, everything's just starting to come out. Um, and we can get, you know, really excited about starting our own seeds inside, watching something grow, and then planting it outside. <clears throat> so you can be successful either way. Um, and there's often a recommendation on your seed packets. Some of them will say, uh, do not transplant, right? Because they might be something that has um, roots that do not like to be disturbed, right? When you go and transplant this guy, these roots are now like, oh, okay, now I need to grow out into this area, right? And you're going to sort of disturb these roots when you're pulling it out of this and putting it into something else. Some things just do not like that. They will not grow well. Um, especially any root vegetables. So if you're trying to grow carrots or radishes or beets, right, things that are root vegetables, because their root is what you're trying to grow, those are things you should not start indoors and then try to plant outside. Um, if you do, your carrot will not be a nice straight carrot. It'll probably be a very crooked carrot because you're disturbing that root, right? When you seed it and then plant outside. Um, you just won't have as good success. So those things generally are recommended that you just start the seeds right outside in their permanent container and not um, start them early indoors, okay? But a lot of things are very adaptable um, and then and you can start them earlier. If you don't, so tomatoes for instance, if you don't, you just won't get tomatoes as early, right? If you start tomatoes indoors, you're gonna be able to harvest your tomato a lot sooner than if you had just sown seed outdoors once it's warm enough. Okay, so um, direct seed or transplant, right? You have to pick one or the other, try to decide which one you're doing. We are talking mostly about transplanting today, right? Starting some things inside. And again, a lot of times your seed packet will recommend um, how many weeks to start something inside. So for instance, this one says when to start inside, recommended eight to 10 weeks before your average last frost date. Um, just trying to see if some of the other ones say anything different. This one says um, three to four weeks before transplanting outdoors, okay? So most times your seed packet, if they recommend transplanting, they will give you an average number of weeks um, that's good to start inside. And if you're doing like um, vegetables, usually three to four weeks is good, um, a good average. If you're doing herbs, sometimes you want a little more time. Some of the herbs are, are a little bit slower. Oregano, thyme, they're pretty slow growing. So those ones you might want to start more like six weeks before you plant outside. Um, your flowers for your cutting garden, for your borders, those you could also do three to four weeks um, would be a good range for those as well. Again, there's going to be some varieties, um, but they're going to be more specialty things that might require more time. In general, three to four weeks is a good range to think about. Um, one thing, if one thing, um, it does take more time is peppers. So I've got a pepper and a tomato here. The pepper was planted um, four weeks before the tomato and they're the same size. Okay. Pepper seeds are just so much slower. They're slower to germinate um, and pepper plants are just so much slower to grow. So there are some particular ones that are gonna need more time like eight weeks or 10 weeks um, to start indoors, but that's really the earliest that you ever want to start anything is eight or ten weeks and generally you're going to need grow lights. You're going to need to add some supplemental lighting um, in order to have enough sunlight unless you have happen to have like a sunroom or something um, like that, but um, so generally I would stay away from things that need more like eight to ten weeks and <clears throat> grow more things that are more like the three to four weeks before planting outside. 
okay? Um, because these are just, they're just harder to do. So if you like a challenge, then that's, that might be one thing to try. Um, okay, so direct seeding or transplanting, um, and then cool weather crops, um, like I mentioned, carrots, beets, lettuce, a lot of those you can transplant outside right now. Um, so while you're starting things that like it warmer, like tomatoes, inside right now, you can also start some things outside right now too. Um, peas, carrots, lettuce, things like that, that can take the cooler temperature. So those are good for direct seeding. Um, Erica, Erica yep. I, have a seed, I have a seed question. Yep. Um, do seeds ever expire? Yes. So what happens is the, there is a, per, there's a general um, percentage of germination. So again, sometimes packets will say that. Um, and typically when you buy seeds, you'll get about a 90, 85 to 90% germination. That means that 85 to 90% of your seeds will grow. Some of them won't, okay? That's just a fact of life. Um, the older the seed, your germination will keep decreasing. So if you keep seed the next year, you might only get 70% germination or 60 or 50%. So it's okay to keep seed and try it. Just know that you probably will not get as many plants growing. A lot of times they will have, like this says that was packed for um, 1121. So um, it should be sold this year. If it's not, a lot of times they'll mark seed down and that's why, because the older the seed is, um, you just do not get as good germination. So that's why that that um, is important, but it doesn't mean don't try. Absolutely, you can still try, but you're gonna have less of them that actually grow. So we're still trying to figure out timing. Right, we know um, that different things have different times. So even if we say three to four weeks is is good, you can start things three to four weeks. Well, when do we know three to four weeks? Right, when is that? Well, most gardeners will use a calendar that is um, marked off by weeks okay, for the year. So um, January first of every year is going to be week one. So even though this year, January 1st was a Friday, that is still considered week one of the growing season or of, the, of, the, of a gardening year, okay? So we right now are at week, what's today? April, we are at week 16, okay? Um, the end of week 16, right? Week 17 is um, tomorrow. <clears throat> So um, using a calendar like this is really helpful to start planning out. And depending on where you are in Connecticut, it's going to be different. Um, we have different what's called hardiness zones, right, throughout the state. Um, hardiness zone refers to the annual minimum temperature. So how cold does it get in the wintertime? So plants can only survive certain temperatures, right? So hardiness zone, um, is more important for things that survive all winter, like perennials or shrubs or trees. It's not that important for annuals, but it's still important to pay attention to those temperatures because that's what determines when you can plant your seeds outside. <clears throat> so what's important to look up is your, your average last frost date in the spring, right? So for us here in Vernon and Tallinn County, it's pretty much May 8th, May 10th. Different sites will give you a little different um, number. Um, I think Hartford, I think I checked again this morning, um, a different site, Hartford, it said was um, May 12th. So somewhere in there is our average last frost date for our area, okay? Um, when it gets close to that date, you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to the weather, right? You're not gonna just pick a date and go with it. But you need to have an idea of when that is. And it's been changing. Um, as, the, um, as the globe, right, as we've had warmer um, weathers, um, global warming occurring, we're actually moving up. It used to be, they used to say that um, Memorial Day was when it was safe to plant out in our area. Right, Memorial Day is the end of May. 
So now we can plant out actually a couple weeks before that. So as it's been warming, you can actually put plants outside a little sooner than you used to be able to, right? So it's just an important thing to look up and know for your area when your average last frost date is, okay? And a lot of sites will give you that information. Um, you might wanna check a couple different sites and sort of get an average. But so for us, um, if May 8th and 10th is like our average last frost date, that would be like the beginning of week 20. So I'm gonna say week 21 is my target, my target week for planting outside. So everything should be safe to go out by week 21. I won't have any more frost. My plants will be good to go, okay? So you need to figure that out for your area, right? If you're in a different um, area than I. Uh, so it's really good to just like sort of start a little calendar and start making notes, okay? Um, yeah, I just saw somebody maybe in the chat said something about the moon. It is good um, to follow that too. Generally, we'll have a frost. Um, if, it's, if it tends to be cooler out when there's a full moon, we might have a frost um, at that. The full moon tends to, be, um, tends to occur. So as I said, when it gets closer to that date, definitely pay attention to your weather. Um, don't just say, okay, it's good to go, right? Because it can, um, it can change. It's just the average frost date. Okay, so once you have your target week picked out, now you can start to back from that, right? We said three to four weeks before we plant this little cucumber outside, we can start it inside. So after you have your target week for planting, back up from that three or four weeks, and that will give you um, a good estimate of when to start those seeds indoors, okay? So if we're at week 17 um, to week 21, right? So we're at a perfect time to be starting seeds indoors for our area right now, for your average um, plants, okay? And even things like herbs, you know, I said that that's like more like six weeks for some herbs. It doesn't mean you can't start them. Um, if you wanna grow them, then just start them. They'll just be a little slower to mature, right? And you'll be able to go buy one that's bigger than what you can grow, but that's okay, right? If you don't mind just being a little patient, you can absolutely still grow them, okay? Um, it's just um, things that are gonna produce some more like a pepper or something that really has a long maturity, right? That takes a long time to grow. You're just not gonna be very successful. You might get one pepper in September by the time you're gonna get frost again, right? So pay attention a little bit to your, um, your days to maturity when it's, when it's harvestable. Okay, so now that we figured out um, when we can plant outside and we backed up to say it's a good time to seed um, for us, now we can start to actually seed um, and grow our plants. So before I get into planting and how to plant, are there other questions in the chat um, right now? Yes, we do have one. And the question is, can I harvest the seeds from the plants that I grow or are the seeds designed to not be replanted? That's a good question. Um, most things, yes. So most things you can harvest your seeds. So even I mentioned lettuce, right? If you leave some lettuce and let it bolt, which just means that it's going to grow a stalk and produce a flower because it's finishing its natural life cycle, after the flower, it will seed. And what you can do is actually put like a little bag over the top of it, um, like a mesh, a mesh bag. Um, trying to think of like an example. I mean, certainly this cloth that I showed you would be good. Um, but if you have like a fine mesh bag, sometimes you'll get like soap in a bag or um, even nylons, right? Like uh, material, you can actually wrap around that so that when those seeds actually pop out of their little tiny capsules, um, you can capture them in that mesh bag. So I would say, yes, most things will come true to seed. There are a few exceptions. Um, and by coming true to seed, I mean, if you, if you harvest the seed, you plant it the following year, you'll get the same thing, right? That's what it means by true to seed. Not everything works that way. Some crops are designed to not produce a mature seed any longer. Um, for instance, seedless watermelon, right? They don't even produce a mature seed um, because they have been 
they have been purposely grown and bred as a plant to not produce a seed because it's nice to eat watermelon without seeds, right? Uh, so there are some things that will not, but in general, yes, absolutely try it. Um, it's, it's fun to be able to do that. Most things will. Uh, some flowers, if, if you're growing from seed, most of the time that means it will produce a seed that you can harvest. Okay, that's maybe a good rule of, a rule of thumb. If you buy a plant that you did not grow from seed, it may not come true from seed, right? It might be something that is actually a clone um, and that will not produce the same plant if you grow from seed. But a good rule of thumb, anything you grow from seed, you can save the seed and grow. Yes. Yep. So that's, that's a really fun thing to do. One, one more came in while you were answering that question. Sure. Um, so are there certain vegetables that should not be put together in the same container or close together in your raised bed? Um, generally, you do not want to put um, cucurbits, which are like your cucumbers and squashes together. They are very similar. And so if you get an insect on one, um, or a disease, it will quickly spread to all of them. So anything that's a cu um, cucurbit, like um, your squash, your cucumbers, your gourds, your pumpkins, generally those things you don't want to plant together. Um, other than that, not really. Um, another thing that's generally recommended though is to, um, if you've had a garden bed for years, is to change where you plant things. So if you plant tomatoes in this part of your garden bed, don't put them there again the next year. Rotate where you put things. Um, because same thing, um, pests and diseases can build up over times in areas um, and you'll have, you'll have the same problem the following year because you had that there. If you plant a different plant, it's most likely not gonna be susceptible to the same pests or diseases. So you'll have more success with it. Um, the other thing with, with rotating your crops is that um, different plants take different nutrients out of the soil and put different nutrients into the soil. So if you're rotating what you plant there, you'll keep your soil healthier longer as well. Um, but yeah, that's, it's definitely, um, that's really the main one is your, your squashes and your cucumbers. Um, the other ones not, don't matter as much. Okay, um, one thing to think about also um, when you're going to start planting is not to plant all your seed. And I know I mentioned this a little bit um, earlier, but <clears throat> there's some things that should be succession planted. Um, so say you buy a package of lettuce, right? So I've got um, Salanova, um, green butter lettuce. If I planted all of this, all of my lettuce is gonna be ready at the same time. So uh, there's no way I can use all that, right? But if I planted, say, six seeds, I might get five that grow to maturity, right? You're probably not going to get 100% of your seed is going to grow and, and mature completely, right? <clears throat> so if I planted six of them, and then in a week or, or even skip a week, every two weeks, if I planted six more seeds, now I'm going to have harvest multiple times, right? So that's what we call succession planting. And I mentioned it when I was talking about a cutting garden with things that are those one and done, like, a, like sunflowers. If you plant all your sunflowers, they're already at the same time, then you're done. But if you planted a few, and then next week plant a few more and a few more, you can harvest sunflowers for a long time, right? Because they'll mature every week. So thinking about succession planting is really good. Um, there are a few things that you shouldn't succession plant, okay? Um, tomatoes, peppers, things that take a long time to mature. If you tried to succession plant peppers, you planted some, and then two weeks later, you planted some more. Those later ones will probably never really produce for you, okay, because they take a long time to mature. So um, things that are good to succession plant are ones that have maybe a shorter maturity date. Maybe they only take 60 days, right, two months to mature, um, not 90 or 100 days to mature. Um, sunflowers, like I said, lettuce, beets, radishes, things that you don't want them already at the same time, 
right? Because a beet is like one and done. It makes a beet, you eat it, and it's gone. Tomato plants produce tomato, and then next week they have more tomatoes, more tomatoes, right? You're harvesting them continually, so you don't need to succession plant those. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One thing that I might recommend succession planting, though, is squash. The only reason I say that is that squash can be really susceptible to powdery mildew and to squash bugs. So you can plant um, a couple squash and get some beautiful squash right away. But like a few weeks, maybe like three, four weeks into the squash, it starts to be not as nice, right? <clears throat> so you could just pull that plant out if you have another one coming along. And so that's again, something I wouldn't plant next to each other. If you have a couple seeds of squash that you put in one part of your garden, and then you have, you started some two weeks later, you started a couple more squash seeds, put them in another part of your garden, okay? has less of a chance for the squash bugs or powdery mildew or whatever is bothering this one to jump over to that one. Okay, so you can plant those separately and plant them a little bit different times. All right, so how to plant. So let's actually plant some things, talk about how to seed them. <clears throat> okay, so first is your soil. There are lots of different types of soil um, that, you can, that you can use, that you can buy. For starting seeds, I do not recommend buying a potting soil that already has fertilizer in it. A lot of like the miracle Grow um, potting soils have fertilizer already in them. They are awesome for your big containers. So if you're going to grow, um, if you're going to do window boxes, um, things like that, that's great to put that potting soil in. But for starting seeds indoors, I do not recommend potting soil that has fertilizer. It can be too strong. Your little plants do not need fertilizer until they are, basically until they go outside. Um, you could start some fertilizer at like two weeks if you wanted to for your baby seedlings, but a lot of times you will burn them. You'll give them too much. Um, they can take a little bit of nutrients out of the soil that, that they're in, um, and they have enough nutrition in them to start to grow, right, to germinate. That's what the seed provides, is that initial nutrition to start to grow. Um, so fertilizing um, can be awesome, but a lot of times you can burn the baby plants. So just be really careful with that. So if it has fertilizer, it's really good for your bigger containers, maybe for that five-gallon bucket that you're gonna to use to actually put your tomato in later. But for starting inside, just get a small bag of germination or potting mix that doesn't have um, fertilizer in it, okay? So I have um, some here. This is a germination mix that I like to use. Um, it's really, really lightweight, very fine. Um, has absolutely no soil in it. It's actually what we call a soilless media. Most of the potting soil that you buy is actually not soil. Um, it's a soil-less media. Uh, dirt or topsoil that's outside is made up of sand, silt, and clay. This has no sand, silt, or clay in it. It's actually usually moss, sphagnum peat moss, um, vermiculite, and perlite, which are two different types of rock um, that are really lightweight, um, actually a volcanic rock. Um, the vermiculite actually holds moisture and the perlite adds, um, helps to give it more air space. Plants need water, but they also need air for their roots. Their roots need oxygen and need air. So you have to provide them with that. If you have nice lightweight soil, your roots can grow really easy in it um, and you'll have a lot greater success with your germination, okay? When you buy your soil, it's really, really dry usually. Um, which is good because it's nice and light, but I don't like to use it that dry. I like to add water to it before you actually put it in the container. Um, so we usually add a little bit and mix it up before we fill our containers. And you're looking not for it to be sopping wet, but you're looking for it to just sort of stick together. So this is a tub that I got just from the hardware store. I think it's um, designed actually for mixing like cement 
or something. So um, it makes a great, great place for potting soil. But of course you could use any kind of a bowl or anything to just mix up your soil in. You'll notice too, as you're adding water that it gets darker. And that's gonna be a really good indicator for you as you're growing your seeds, how uh, much moisture you have in your soil and when you need to add water to your babies. When it's dry, it's really light in color. And then as it gets wet, it gets uh, much, much darker in color. Okay, so this is probably pretty good. Um, notice it's like clumping together, right? It's not just falling apart anymore, um, but I'm not getting water out of it, right? If I squeeze it. So that's a really good consistency um, for your soil. One thing you do not want to use is topsoil. You don't want to go outside and just scoop some, some dirt from the ground, okay? And put that in your pot. It's really important to use potting soil for any container that you're using. If you're doing a raised garden bed, that's a little different because it doesn't have a bottom on it and it's a big area, right? But for anything that's confined, any type of a container, you want to use a potting soil. If you use just regular topsoil or dirt, it's gonna be really heavy, very compact, and the roots are not gonna be able to grow in it. The reason they can grow out in regular soil is that it's not confining. There are a lot of natural things that happen in the soil. There's worms that go through and aerate the soil. There's a lot of insects, there's bacteria. There's a lot of natural processes that help to keep the soil functioning, right? But as soon as you take that soil and you pack it into a little pot, you're cutting it off from all of those natural processes that occur and you will not be successful. It'll be super heavy, too dense, um, too wet for your, your plants. Okay, so do not, do not use a topsoil in a container. Definitely buy potting soil. Okay, so um, you could use more of a traditional potting soil rather than, a, uh, rather than a germination mix. I don't know if you can see the difference here between these two. This is germination. It's a lot lighter of a soil. Um, has little tiny pieces of things in it, very, very even. This is more of a standard potting soil. It's a little heavier. A lot of times it will have chunks of twigs in it, little pieces of wood, a lot chunkier pieces of peat moss, right? It's just like not ground up fine, like a germination mix is. You'll still be okay with this. So if you got just a traditional potting soil, you'll still be okay. Most seeds will do absolutely fine. Um, it's just, this is sort of like, you know, giving them special treatment, right? Um, the finer soil is, is really, really nice for them. Um, maybe like sleeping on a really nice mattress versus a lumpy one. Um, not, a, not a big, big deal. Um, again, I just would recommend no fertilizer for starting seeds. But if you've got more of a chunky potting soil, it's okay. You'll still be successful with that. Okay. So types of soil, we covered that. I do recommend way, um, watering it a little bit. We talked about not doing topsoil. Okay, so choosing your containers. Um, you can use pretty much anything. The main thing that I would suggest is that it has drainage in it, okay? If you use something um, like a carton or a cottage cheese container, right? Just put some holes in the bottom first. You could use, I mean, obviously you could use like a drill. Um, you might be able to use a hammer and a nail to punch a few holes in it. But I would really suggest drainage. It's too easy to drown your plants, to give them too much water. The roots don't have air. They will just rot. Your seeds will rot and you will not have any success. So it's, it, it's really important to have some type of a little drainage hole um, in your pot. If you have leftover pots, right, plastic containers or something, absolutely just use those. Um, if you don't have any pots, um, some people recommend, which works beautifully too, is actually using eggshells, okay? Again, you might want to put a couple little holes in it so you don't rot them. Um, 
in the bottom, you could use like a, a needle, right? Put a couple little holes in there. But this guy makes a really cute little pot. Really, really cute little planter um, for a seed or two. If you try growing directly in an egg carton, some people have had success with that. I find it just too dry. I cannot keep it moist enough um, in the egg carton. These are, are so thick and dry that it just takes all the water right out of the soil. Um, so I really have not had success with the egg carton, but eggshells are great. Um, and of course you can put them in the egg carton um, to grow them, but, but really a neat natural way to start some little seeds. So that's kind of fun. Um, peat pots, right? You can use something like this that you can buy um, at your garden center or any pots or containers um, are fine. Whatever works for you. Um, when you fill your container, do not pack your soil. Again, you don't want it to be compact. We tend to just fill them up very lightly like that, and that's it. As you plant your seed um, and water it, it will compact a little bit, and so then it will go down a little bit and leave like a little space at the top, right, for when you do water it in the future. Um, but like this was started like this, and just after you water it and put your seeds in, then it packs the soil naturally a little bit without having to um, even pack it by hand. Okay? You don't want to overdo it. You don't want it to be super tight. Move this out of our way. All right, so if you're planting in a big container, um, you know, like this, or even directly in a window box um, inside, maybe you want to do an herb garden, um, right in here, you can absolutely do that. And just plant like a couple different types of seeds in each um, each area. Okay, so um, you've got your container, you've got your soil all set. Now what you need to figure out is how many seeds to plant, how far apart, and their depth, right? So again, it's gonna to totally vary. Refer back to that seed packet. It'll tell you the depth that you need um, and it'll also give you spacing for your plants. The other thing to pay attention to is, does it need light or darkness, okay? Some plants need darkness to germinate, but you don't have to cover them. So they're, they're tiny. Um, an example is larkspur. Larkspur is a, um, cutting flower that you would grow for cut flowers. Um, the, the seeds are super small. You just put them on the surface of the soil, but then you, they need darkness. So you can actually just cover them with like um, a plate or like a plastic lid that goes to a bowl that you have or something. Just put a, a, a cover on them. You don't want it to be super heavy or tight, but you can just put a cover down and just check on them every, um, every few days but they actually need darkness to germinate. Some things need light to germinate and you put them on top of the soil, you don't cover them at all and you need to make sure that they have light. They do not need sunlight, okay? A big mistake that people will make when they're starting their seeds is they'll put their seeds in their pot and then they'll go put their pot on their windowsill. Your windowsill is one of the coldest places this time of year in your house, okay? The, the glass is cold, the sill itself tends to be really cold. That is like the worst place for starting seeds, okay? They do not need sunlight to germinate, they just need light, okay? So if you just have natural light in your house, that's more than enough light to get those seeds to start growing, okay? Um, if they require light. If they require darkness, then they should be covered. But seeds like warmth. They do not want cold to germinate. Um, it's one of the reasons you just can't go out and start just anything right now outside is because they will not grow when it's that cold. The best place to germinate your seeds is on top of your refrigerator, on top of a microwave. Um, I would say television. If you have an old box television, put me on top of there, but everybody's got flat screens nowadays. Um, because those, those, um, Appliances produce heat, right? When they're running. So they, those tend to be some of the warmer places in your house. Um, they don't need sunlight, they need warmth to germinate. 
once they've germinated, once they're popping through, then they need sunlight, okay? Then you can move this guy to your windowsill. And even if your windowsill is more like 55, 60 degrees and not 70, that's okay. It needs the sunlight at that point, um, not as much warmth, okay? Once they're germinated, they can withstand a little bit cooler temperatures, um, but definitely need sunlight. Okay, so um, we got moisture, we got warmth. Uh, well, we didn't talk about moisture. We talked about warmth and so seedling depth. Again, paying attention to what they need. So these are um, some chives, right, which is an herb. Um, this one says cover with a quarter inch of fine soil. So when you plant these, and if you have one of these, if you want to get one of these nifty little um, cedars, I love this little guy. Rather than putting them in your hand, in the palm of your hand, um, this little guy works great. It actually vibrates the seed if you click it. Um, I like to even just tap it, but it just helps me get just like one or two seeds um, right where I want them. Um, so this guy, I'm just gonna pop, put a couple seeds down. When you're doing herbs, you can do a couple seeds together. Um, you don't need to have them super spaced apart. So I'm doing like a couple inches. And remember, every seed is not going to grow. So if you get two seeds in one spot, that's okay too. Don't, you know, don't worry about that. Right? So I've got my shives in here. Sometimes it's nice to press them in. The seeds do good if they have direct contact with that soil. And now you're ready to water it and then cover it lightly with a little more soil. So that one said um, a quarter inch. So you can use the same soil and just lightly dust it on there um, like that. If you're doing a bigger seed like a squash or a green bean, these are green beans, they're much, much bigger seeds, you could just push them down in, okay? Um, and then cover them over, right? those need to be about a quarter inch. Generally, the rule of thumb with seed depth is the size of the seed is how deep it goes. So with a teeny tiny seed, it basically doesn't get buried. Um, like lettuce is so tiny, you can hardly see them. Snapdragons, they're like little flecks of dust, so tiny. Okay, moisture. Let's talk a little bit about moisture. When you water these, the best way to water is bottom water, okay? your seeds can easily get, um, if you were to, if I were to just dump water on top of here, right, like this, the seeds would kind of get washed away, right, get washed to different parts, plus I'm probably going to put a hole in my soil um, from where it's, the water's pouring out. So if instead you have some kind of a tray, and you could do, use like a 13 by 9 pan, um, a cookie sheet, right, anything like that, pour the water into there, and let your plant sit in the water. What you can watch for is you've got this light colored soil. If it sits in here long enough, it will absorb water all the way up the water column and you'll see the water glisten, right? You'll see the soil all glistening and moist on the top and it'll be dark, pretty, pretty dark brown. Then you'll know it's gotten enough water. You can take it out of your tray and set it where it's going to germinate. Most seeds um, that germinate in like five days, seven days, 10 days, probably do not need any more water until you see them germinate, until you see their little shoot coming through. You can check on them after a few days to see, but in general, that's going to be enough moisture to get them to grow. Okay? You don't want to overwater them. Um, if you start to see them get um, really, really light on the surface, if the soil is getting super light, then you know um, it's time to water them again. Once they're growing like this, you can water from the top, right? There's no problem then once you have little babies growing. It's just when you have seeds, it's really good to water from the bottom um, instead of the top. And then remember, once you see them coming up, move them into the sunlight, okay? Not before. Keep them in the warmest spot you have. They really like 70, 80 degrees um, heat. Their, their soil is going to be cooler than the air temperature, okay? 
So if you can give them more like 80 degrees right here, that's gonna really help that soil warm up in them to grow, okay? That's why I suggested on a refrigerator or microwave or something, some appliance like that that's generating some heat is gonna be really good. Of course, you can buy heat mats too, um, seating mats if you want to really get fancy. That's always an option. Okay. Erica, Last. I have a question, I have a question yes. about the water. So someone yeah. asked, how do you water the eggs? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I guess I would probably take them out. Well, I don't know. I guess I would just leave them right in this whole thing and water them, but you might want to, you might have to sprinkle them over the top um, in order to give them water. Just don't use a pitcher. Um, if you have a, if you have a um, uh, watering can that has a nice end on it with little tiny holes, it's hard to find. It's hard to get a nice sprinkler. The other thing you could do is just water bottle. I thought I had one nearby, I don't see it. But you could just use a water bottle and actually mist them probably enough um, to give them enough water. You could hold them in water. They're pretty small, as long as you have a hole or two in the bottom, right? That's gonna absorb moisture right up to it. Um, you could just hold them in water a little bit and then put them back in your, in your pot. Um, but yeah, this guy is just, um, this thing just does not wet very easily. Uh, and then once it does, it starts to rip apart. So yeah, I guess I would hold it in water um, until it's pretty wet. And then you could also, like I said, spray um, on top of it too to make sure it's moist. Mm, but that's a good question. That's a little unique. Another question we have is which herbs are best to grow from seed versus a starter plant? Um, rosemary is really hard um, to grow. That's definitely something if you're interested in rosemary, definitely get a plant. Um, oregano and thyme, you can grow some seed. They just take long, more like eight to 10 weeks to start them earlier inside. Um, <clears throat> they're just super slow. Basil, cilantro, dill, those are really easy, really um, easy to grow. Parsley uh, might take a little longer to germinate, but easy to grow. Dill, cilantro, thyme, um, thyme slow. Yeah, basil is super easy. Um, basil is a good one to succession plant too, um, because you're really harvesting all of it. Um, if you use a lot of basil, you might want to plant, you know, some seeds and then two weeks later plant a few more seeds. Um, that way you'll have sort of a continuous supply. Um, yeah. Okay, trying to watch the time here. It's almost 12 already. Um, last thing I really wanted to talk about, something that I feel like a lot of people maybe don't know is what we call hardening off. You've been growing this beautiful little cucumber plant in your house at about 70 degrees for four weeks. You do not want to just one day take it and plant it outside. He's not gonna be happy. It's gonna shock your little baby, okay? What you need to do is harden it off. So hardening off is a process of slowly getting it used to the outdoor temperatures, okay? You don't wanna go from 70 to 50 um, just in one day. So the hardening off process, anytime you have warm weather, so if we have a beautiful day like we just had, not yesterday with all the snow, but earlier in the week, we had like a day where it got up to 70, Put your little babies outside. Let them enjoy that, even if it's for an hour or two. That's great. Bring them back in, okay? So on a beautiful day, go ahead and put them out. If it's 70, even if it's 65, that little degree difference from going from inside to outside, if it's only five degrees, 10 degrees, that's okay, that's good. To start getting them used to that change in temperature. Once you plant them outside, they're gonna have to withstand down to like 40 at night right? They're going to have to withstand 80 degrees during the day, 60 at night, 70 during the day, 50 at night, those um, temperature extremes. So take the time a week, at least a week before you plant them outside, a week or two, and start to put them out. The other suggestion is not to put them out in full sun. So it's a beautiful sunny day. You take your little baby that's hardly been in the sun. He's been just on the windowsill and you put it out in full sun at 70 degrees for four hours, he's not gonna be happy, okay? It's just too much of a shock. 
if it's 70 degrees and you put it outside, put it where there's some shade for a couple hours, bring it back in. The next day, you could maybe put it in the sun for one hour and then in the shade for a couple hours, then bring it back in, okay? It's this gradual process of getting it used to those outdoor temperatures. By the time you're ready to plant, the week before, a few days before, he could just be sitting outside, okay? So outside day and night, if the temperature is good, if it's say it's gonna get down to 50, but you've had it used to 60 already because you've already had it outside for a few days during when it was 60, but you brought it in at night. Now it's gonna be 50 at night. Go ahead and leave it outside day and night before you plant it out in those same conditions, okay? It's just this gradual process of getting it used to those temperature extremes and getting it used to going from some sun to full sun outside. Okay? So it's just a very gradual thing, do a few hours, and then keep lengthening that as long as the weather's nice, right? If you have a really cold day, don't have to put it outside at all that day. Skip a day or two and then start putting it back outside again. Now you'll have much better success, much healthier plants. So that's called hardening off. Okay, um, let me wrap up and then if there's a question or two, I'm happy to take those. Um, but kind of in closing, I just wanted to say, um, you know, try something, start small. Um, don't go buy tons of stuff and try to do this huge thing because I want you to be successful. Um, if you're successful this year, then you're more likely to try again, right? And do a little bit more next year. But absolutely try something new. Try something you've never done. Um, it's great to do. Another suggestion is to take notes. Write down what you did. Write down when you started things. Have a little journal. Um, when did it actually grow? Um, what was the temperature outside when you started hardening it off? Um, the more notes, the more information you write down, the more knowledgeable you'll become, the more experience you'll gain um, just in note-taking. And then next year, you'll be that much more willing um, and eager to try it again if you've had some success. So um, definitely take notes, um, write down what you've done. And then when you start seeds, be patient. Remember some seeds, they won't even grow for two weeks. You'll be staring at this soil for two weeks on top of your refrigerator, okay? Um, so be patient. They will grow. They will come up. Um, give them some warmth. Make sure they're moist and let them do their thing. So I hope you try something. I hope you have some um, success and enjoy doing some growing this year. Thank you. Erica, we have a, a couple more questions that we can potentially sure. get to. Um, so the first one is, are there any veggies or herbs that are easier to grow or you have a higher rate of success if uh, travel causes a lapse in watering, rotating into sunlight, all of those things? Mm, okay, so vegetables and herbs that are easier to grow. Tomatoes really are easy. Um, cucumbers, squash are really, really easy. Um, definitely recommend squash. Cu cucumbers are super they, have, they don't have a lot of diseases, a lot of problems. Um, you can get a lot, of, um, a lot of harvest from a cucumber. So that's really, really fun to do. Um, green beans are pretty easy too. Um, absolutely try those. And then tomatoes, tomatoes grow super easy, super fast. Um, you'll get, they come up quick um, and they grow quickly. So they're really fun, fun to do. As far as herbs, really basil, you'll have great success with basil. Um, super easy to grow. Um, so is cilantro. So definitely try um, those two. Dill is really easy also. So those would be some good, good herb ones. Yeah, as far as travel, that's kind of a hard one. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Um, if you're trying to do like the um, hardening off phase, if that's what you're talking about those last couple of weeks, just check the temperature. You know, um, when you're home, put it outside for a couple hours. If you're gonna be gone for um, a couple days, leave it inside. Um, if you're gonna be, um, if you're gonna be gone a couple days, but the weather looks good, go ahead and leave it outside, but in like a lighter shade um, area. But yeah, they really need attention. Once they're really growing like this, they're gonna need water every day. Um, it's just when you first seed them before they're even coming up, when they're just in their germination process that they probably don't need hardly any water. Um, but once they really start to grow, they need water pretty much every day. So that can be a little tricky with travel. And one final question in the last couple of minutes. Um, an attendee had uh, two to three potato uh, tomato plants 
and an outdoor planter that was about 15 inches. Um, and several of the fruits developed the blossom end rot. Do you have any um, tips to prevent that this year? Uh, they asked about a larger container, fewer plants. That's not the issue, no. <clears throat> um, the issue usually with blossom end rot is calcium, blossom end rot. Um, it's usually deficient in calcium. You can actually mix up um, a diluted mixture of milk and water um, and spray it on your tomato plant. So if you have like an empty water bottle and you do some uh, milk and water, you probably should look it up, I don't know, um, offhand if it's like 50-50, um, and drench your plant, spray your plant, your tomato plant until it's like dripping wet with this milk and water mixture. That will help with black and wrap. Awesome. Well, Erica, thank you so much. I know I learned a lot. I think I might maybe be brave enough to try something <laughs> this year in the spring. Um, so thank you all who joined us. Um, good luck with your growing. Happy spring. Um, and Erica, again, thank you so much for um, giving us all of your knowledge and, and sharing with all of us today. There's been um, a lot of great conversation in the chat. So thank you so much. And everyone be safe and stay well. Um, and happy spring. Thanks, Very everybody. Welcome. Bye. Goodbye.